100 years since the discovery of the greatest treasure in the world, King Tutankhamun. King Tutankhamun, or simply King Tut, ruled Egypt as pharaoh for 10 years until his death at age 19, around 1324 BC though his rule was notable for reversing the religious reforms of his father Akhenaten, Tutankhamun's legacy was largely negated by his successors. He was barely known to the modern world until 1922, when British archaeologist Howard Carter chiseled into the intact tomb of King Tut. The tomb's hoard of treasure, intended to accompany the king into the afterlife, revealed an incredible amount about life in ancient Egypt, and made Tutankhamun the world's most famous pharaoh. Who was King Tut? Genetic testing has verified that King Tut was the grandson of the great pharaoh Amenhotep III, and almost certainly the son of Akhenaten, a controversial figure in the history of the 18th dynasty of Egypt's new kingdom, circa 1550-1295 BC. Akhenaten appended a centuries-old religious system to favor worship of a single deity, the sun god Aden, and moved Egypt's religious capital from Thebes to Amarna. After Akhenaten's death, two intervening pharaohs briefly reigned before the nine-year-old prince, then called Tutankhaten, took the throne. Tutankhamun reversed Akhenaten's reforms early in his reign, reviving worship of the god Amun, restoring Thebes as a religious center and changing the end of his name to reflect royal allegiance to the creator god Amun. He also worked in concert with his powerful advisors Horemheb and I, both future pharaohs, to restore Egypt's stature in the region. How did King Tut die? There are many theories as to what killed King Tut at the age of 19. He was tall but physically frail, with a crippling bone disease in his clubbed left foot. He is the only pharaoh known to have been depicted seated while engaged in physical activities like archery. Traditional inbreeding in the Egyptian royal family also likely contributed to the boy king's poor health and early death. DNA tests published in 2010 revealed that Tutankhamun's parents were brother and sister, and that King Tut's wife Ankhesenamun was also his half-sister. Their only two daughters were stillborn. Because Tutankhamun's remains revealed a hole in the back of the skull, some historians had concluded that the young king was assassinated, but recent tests suggest that the hole was made during mummification. CT scans in 1995 showed that the king had an infected broken left leg, while DNA from his mummy revealed evidence of multiple malaria infections, all of which may have contributed to his early death. King Tut. Mummy and Tomb. After he died, Tutankhamun was mummified according to Egyptian religious tradition, which held that royal bodies should be preserved and provisioned for the afterlife. Embalmers removed his organs and wrapped him in resin-soaked bandages, a 24-pound solid gold portrait mask was placed over his head and shoulders and he was laid in a series of nested containers, three golden coffins, a granite sarcophagus and four gilded wooden shrines, the largest of which barely fit into the tomb's burial chamber. Because of his tomb's small size, historians suggest King Tut's death must have been unexpected and his burial rushed by I, who succeeded him as pharaoh. The tomb's antechambers were packed to the ceiling with more than 5,000 artifacts, including furniture, chariots, clothes, weapons and 130 of the lame king's walking sticks. The entrance corridor was apparently looted soon after the burial, but the inner rooms remained sealed. The pharaohs who followed King Tut chose to ignore his reign, as despite his work restoring Amun, Tutankhamun was tainted by the connection to his father's religious upheavals. Within a few generations, the tomb's entrance had been clogged with stone debris, built over by workmen's huts and forgotten. Howard Carter, a British archaeologist who had been excavating Egyptian antiquities for three decades, and discovered Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. At the time of the discovery, archaeologists believed that all the royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings, across the river from ancient Thebes, had already been cleared. Excitement about the new tomb, the most intact ever found, quickly spread worldwide, igniting a global fascination with the boy pharaoh and the powerful civilization of ancient Egypt. It took Carter and his team a decade to catalog and empty the tomb. Did you know, Carter's patron, Lord Carnarvon, died four months after first entering the tomb, leading journalists to popularize a curse of the pharaohs, claiming that hieroglyphs on the tomb walls promised swift death to those who disturbed King Tut. More than a dozen deaths have been attributed to the curse, but studies have shown that those who entered the tomb on average lived just as long as their peers who didn't enter. 
Artifacts from King Tut's tomb have toured the world in several blockbuster museum shows, including the worldwide 1972-1979 Treasures of Tutankhamun exhibitions. Eight million visitors in seven U.S. cities viewed the exhibition of the Golden Burial Mask and 50 other precious items from the tomb. Today the most fragile artifacts, including the burial mask, no longer leave Egypt. Tutankhamun's mummy remains on display within the tomb in the Valley of the Kings in the KV-62 chamber, his layered coffins replaced with a climate-controlled glass box. His golden mask is on display at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, but the Tutankhamun collection will eventually move to the Grand Egyptian Museum, or GEM, located near the Pyramids of Giza. Tut may not have been frail. King Tut is known for being a fragile young man who limped on a clubfoot. He got this reputation because some CT images seem to show his left foot is deformed. Plus, he was buried with more than 130 walking sticks. But, recent research suggests it's wrong to portray Tut as a fragile pharaoh, says Bob Breyer, who is a mummy researcher, Egyptologist and an expert on King Tut. Ancient Egyptian officials were often depicted with walking sticks, notes Breyer. Those staffs, he says, were signs of authority, not frailty. Plus, researchers don't agree about whether images of Tut's bones show serious deformities. Other clues from King Tut's mummy and tomb also hint that he might have been physically fit. He might even have fought in wars. Tut was buried with military chariots, leather armor and archery equipment. Those items suggest the young king wanted to be viewed as a hunter and a warrior. What's more, inscribed blocks from Tut's temple show the pharaoh leading soldiers in chariots into battle. The inscriptions do not include dates for the battles. But if more blocks turn up showing battle scenes with dates, it would hint that Tut was in those conflicts, Breyer says. Tut's tomb was a rushed job. Pharaohs usually prepared their tombs over decades. They built many rooms to hold treasures and ornate coffins. But King Tut died too young for that. There was no time for such long preparations. Plus, Egyptian traditions required laying a mummified body in a tomb about 70 days after death. That window gave craftsmen little time to finish crucial tomb items, many of which required a year or more to make. Such burial objects include a carved stone sarcophagus that held three nested coffins. Also, Tut's tomb was supposed to hold four shrines, hundreds of servant statues, a gold mask, chariots and jewelry. An especially important piece was a chest that contained four mini gold coffins. These held the king's internal organs that were removed when he was mummified. A painting of Tutankhamun and his queen is on the backrest of his gold throne. It displays a painting of the king and his queen, Ankhesenamun. The pair are shown in an unusually relaxed pose for Egyptian royal art. Changes to the royal's names on the throne indicate that officials tried to erase the memory of Tutankhamun's controversial father, King Akhenaten, and his family members. Workers seem to have taken many objects for Tut from other people's tombs. These included the young king's throne, the three nested coffins and shrine, and tiny coffins for his organs, says Peter Durmanwalian. He's an archaeologist at Harvard University in Cambridge, Mass. Even cutting those corners, time ran out. Consider the sarcophagus. Two of four goddesses on the stone container lack fully carved jewelry. Workers painted on missing jewelry parts. Carved pillars on the sarcophagus also are unfinished. There's also the sarcophagus lid, it's granite, which doesn't match the quartzite bottom. Something must have happened to the original quartzite lid. Workers carved a new lid from available granite and painted it to look like quartzite. But repairs on the new lid show it broke in half during the carving process. Tutankhamun was buried with a cracked, mismatched sarcophagus lid, Breyer says. Some researchers think that Tut's hasty burial place was not even meant for him. One who feels that way is Egyptologist Nicholas Reeves. He works at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Reeves argues that Tut's tomb was meant for Nefertiti. She was the wife of King Tut's father. Reeves thinks she briefly succeeded Akhenaten as Egypt's ruler, until Tut became king. No one has found Nefertiti's tomb yet. But Reeves predicts that one wall of Tut's burial chamber blocks access to a larger tomb where she lies. Painted scenes and writing on that wall depict Tut doing a ritual on Nefertiti's mummy, he says. And the style of those paintings was used only years before Tut's burial. Reeves' hunch is intriguing, 
But four of five remote sensing studies done inside Tut's burial chamber show no evidence of a hidden tomb. So, the question of who this burial space was truly meant for remains a mystery. Tutankhamun has the smallest royal tomb in the Valley of the Kings. The first pharaohs built highly conspicuous pyramids in Egypt's northern deserts. However, by the time of the New Kingdom 1550-1069 BC, this fashion had ended. Most kings were now buried in relative secrecy in rock-cut tombs tunneled into the Valley of the Kings on the west bank of the Nile at the southern city of Thebes modern-day Luxor. These tombs had inconspicuous doors, but were both spacious and well-decorated inside. Cemeteries carried their own potent magic, and dead kings were thought to have powerful spirits that might benefit others. Burial amongst his ancestors would have helped Tutankhamun to achieve his own afterlife. It therefore seems likely that Tutankhamun would have wished to be buried in a splendid tomb in either the main valley or in an offshoot, the western valley, where his grandfather, Amenhotep III, was buried. But, whatever he may have intended, we know that Tutankhamun was actually buried in a cramped tomb cut into the floor of the main valley. It may be that Tutankhamun simply died too young to complete his ambitious plans. His own tomb was unfinished, and so he had to be buried in a substitute, non-royal tomb. However, this seems unlikely, as other kings managed to build suitable tombs in just two or three years. It seems far more likely that Tutankhamun's successor, I, a king who inherited the throne as an elderly man, made a strategic swap. Just four years after Tutankhamun's death, I himself was buried in a splendid tomb in the western valley, close by the tomb of Amenhotep III. The unexpectedly small size of Tutankhamun's tomb has led to recent suggestions that there may be parts as yet undiscovered. Currently Egyptologists are investigating the possibility that there may be secret chambers hidden behind the plastered wall of his burial chamber. Tutankhamun's heart is missing. The ancient Egyptians believed that it was possible to live again after death, but thought that this could only be achieved if the body was preserved in a lifelike condition. This led them to develop the science of artificial mummification. Essentially, mummification involved desiccating the body in natron salt, then wrapping it in many layers of bandages to preserve a lifelike shape. The body's internal organs were removed at the start of the mummification process and preserved separately. The brain, its function then unknown, was simply thrown away, the heart, rather than the brain, was regarded as the organ of reasoning. As such, the heart would be required in the afterlife. It was therefore left in place and, if accidentally removed, immediately sewn back, though not always in its original location. Tutankhamun, however, has no heart. Instead he was provided with an amuletic scarab inscribed with a funerary spell. This may have happened simply because the undertakers were careless, but it could also be a sign that Tutankhamun died far from home. By the time his body arrived at the undertaker's workshop, his heart may have been too decayed to be preserved. Tutankhamun was buried in the world's most expensive coffin. Two of Tutankhamun's three coffins were made of wood, covered with gold sheet. But, to Howard Carter's great surprise, the innermost coffin was made from thick sheets of beaten gold. This coffin measures 1.88 meters in length, and weighs 110.4 kilograms. If it were to be scrapped today it would be worth well over 1 million pounds. But as Tutankhamun's final resting place it is, of course, priceless. Tutankhamun's Curse Pharaohs had been buried there from the 16th to the 11th centuries BC in the Valley of the Kings, across the Nile from Luxor in Egypt. Most of the tombs had been plundered from early times and Tutankhamun's was the first to be found almost entirely undisturbed. The fifth Earl of Carnarvon, a keen amateur Egyptologist who was financing the project, joined Carter and his team to enter the burial chambers, where they found the young pharaoh's mummified body and a wealth of religious objects, wall paintings and inscriptions as well as equipment he would need in the afterlife. The discovery created a worldwide press sensation and stories spread about a curse on anyone who dared to break into a pharaoh's tomb. The Times in London and New York World magazine published the best-selling novelist Marie Corelli's speculations that, the most dire punishment follows any rash intruder into a sealed tomb. It was not long before Lord Carnarvon died in Cairo aged 56 and the lights in the city went out, which set off a frenzy of speculation. Arthur Conan Doyle told the American press that, an evil elemental, spirit created by priests to protect the mummy could have caused Carnarvon's death. 
No curse had actually been found in the tomb, but deaths in succeeding years of various members of Carter's team and real or supposed visitors to the site kept the story alive, especially in cases of death by violence or in odd circumstances. Alleged victims of the curse included Prince Ali Kamel Fahmy Bey of Egypt, shot dead by his wife in 1923, Sir Archibald Douglas Reed, who supposedly X-rayed the mummy and died mysteriously in 1924. Sir Lee Stack, the Governor General of the Sudan, who was assassinated in Cairo in 1924, Arthur Mace of Carter's excavation team, said to have died of arsenic poisoning in 1928, Carter's secretary Richard Bethel, who supposedly died smothered in his bed in 1929, and his father, who committed suicide in 1930. Most people who worked in or visited the tomb lived long lives, but this did not undermine belief in the curse by those who wanted to believe it. Carter himself angrily dismissed the whole curse idea as, Tommy Rock, but when he died solitary and miserably unhappy of Hodgkin's disease in his London flat in March 1939 at the age of 64, the story of the mummy's curse sprang back to life in his obituaries and it has persisted to this day. Curses relating to tombs are extremely rare, possibly because the idea of such desecration was unthinkable and even dangerous to record. They most frequently occur in private tombs of the Old Kingdom era. The tomb of Anctify, 9 10th dynasty, contains the warning, any ruler who, shall do evil or wickedness to this coffin, may Heman, a local deity, not accept any goods he offers, and may his heir not inherit. The tomb of Kentika Ikeki, 6th dynasty, contains an inscription, as for all men who shall enter this my tomb, impure, there will be judgment, an end shall be made for him. I shall seize his neck like a bird, I shall cast the fear of myself into him. Curses after the Old Kingdom era are less common though more severe, sometimes invoking the ire of Thoth or the destruction of Sekhem. And what about you? Do you really believe in Pharaoh's curse? Thank you very much for watching the video. Please like, share, subscribe.